spend the next 20 minutes talking about the future of the mind. I want to start in the present. Before we speak about the future, we have to speak about the current. And let's start by talking about the brain. As you know, our brain is an incredible information processing system. It allows us to interpret information in the environment within tenths of seconds. Over the course of our lives, we store a billion bits of information. That's 50,000 times the data in the Library of Congress. And we could connect events separated by decades. How then does our brain deal with this? We know, I don't have to explain to you, over the last several decades, we've seen an explosion in information technology. And this next chapter in our information revolution is fascinating because what it's really shown us is that at our core, we are information-seeking creatures. Us primates have co-opted those ancient reward systems that drove other animals to forage for food. We forage for information. And this has resulted not just in a massive amount of devices that we use, but a shift in how we use them. We know that 95% of people report multitasking every day. It could be a third of our day. And if you're a young person, the reports are up to seven devices at any given time. And it's not just how we use it. It's where and when. They are in our bathrooms, in our bedrooms, in our classrooms, in our restaurants. They go on vacation with us. We've seen this very profound shift in expectations, such that now 24-7 productivity and availability is just expected of us. And there's been a very dramatic shift in how we interact with each other, ourselves, and our environment. And it could be amusing, or it could be more threatening, as we know by this very uh, important and dangerous example of texting and driving or using devices in the car. So let's pause first and say, what's going on in here? How does our brain manage this? So neuroscience has revealed that we have these core set of abilities called cognitive control that enable us to navigate this complex world that we live in. And we look at this as a triad of abilities. The first is attention, our ability to focus our limited resources when and where we want them. Then there's working memory, holding information in mind for short periods of time to guide our behavior. And then there's what we call goal management. Goal management is our ability or our inability to multitask and switch between tasks. And as amazing as these abilities are, we know that they have very, very defined limitations. So we can focus our attention, but we can't distribute it broadly, right? We have to make selections about where we put our resources. We can hold information in mind, but there's a very strict limitation on the capacity. And the fidelity of that information is not as high as when we perceive things. And then when we switch between tasks or attempt to multitask, we find that we cannot parallel process two attention-demanding tasks at the same time. Instead, we move between brain networks. And with each switch, there's a loss in the resolution of that information. And then there are our very high-level goal-setting abilities. I would say that our ability to set high-level goals are the pinnacle of the human brain. We have this ability to set very long, time-delayed goals that are complex and interwoven with other goals and other people's goals. And then so you have these high-level goal-setting abilities, and they collide directly with our limitations in our cognitive control. And this creates interference. And this is really the crux of the issue. There's a conflict between what we want to do and what we're actually capable of doing. And this is why I say we have ancient brains living in a high-tech world. These are just fundamental limitations that are there, and we are faced with this every day. This interference then pervades every single aspect of how our brain works, from our decision-making, our memory, our emotions, our perceptual abilities. And then we see it propagate throughout our lives so that you have an impact across every domain of how you interact with the world around you. So what do we do about this? This is our current state. I'm sure most of you can even feel the burden, in addition to all the advantages of our technology. So I look at there as really two things, two pathways for us. One, we could modify our behavior, which is critically important. The other thing is we could enhance our brains. So in this concept of the, maybe not in a horrifying way like that, but you know, it's a general idea. How do we change our behaviors? I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this right now, but the first thing is to increase our awareness of our limitations in interacting with the world around us, changing our accessibility to technology, and then dealing with the fact that we have no tolerance for boredom and a very high level of anxiety when forced to do one thing at a time. 
So I'm just going to put that out there, but there's a lot that we can do to modify our behavior. How about changing our brains? Again, there's a wide landscape of approaches that we can take to improving our brain function. And I don't have time to go through all of these today, so I'm just going to focus on one of them, technology. It's appropriate being right here in, uh, in Silicon Valley and, and the Bay Area. We are at a phase shift right now in terms of our consumer technology. We know that there is the emergence of consumer level, virtual reality, augmented reality, wearable physiological devices, motion capture, and artificial intelligence, and other machine learning algorithms. Most of this technology is positioned in the entertainment and communication world. The goal and the challenge, I really think this is a pivot point, especially here in the tech capital of the world, that we need to build our technology with full awareness and appreciation of the human condition and learn how we can create tools that help improve not just our cognitive control abilities, but our perception, our memory, our decision making, our emotional regulation, and optimally, wisdom and compassion. Can we use our tech to build the mind? That is the goal. I would say that it is completely possible, and it's not even that complicated, it's because technology can be used to create experiences. And as we know, experiences are the entire gateway to our brain's plasticity. This is the whole fundamental ability of our brain to modify itself at every level, from its structure, its chemistry, and its function, all in response to experience. We know very well how strong this relationship is between experience and plasticity. You could be a young person, go off to war, not get shrapnel in your head, but just witness through your eyeballs a tragic event, which will detrimentally impact the function of your brain for the rest of your life. Right? We call that PTSD. So we know that experience can drive powerful, enduring brain plasticity. How do we build technology or leverage existing technology to optimally harness our brain's plasticity, to enhance our cognition, to refine our behavior, and ultimately to elevate our minds? We could do that, in my opinion, by building what is known as closed-loop systems. So a closed loop is where we intervene in some way, any way, and you record as rapidly as possible the impact. You then use that data to refine your intervention. So if it wasn't enough, you increase it. If it was too much, you pull it back. You apply again, record, refine, and cycle over and over, optimizing at every stage. This is exactly how our, not how our current system of education or medicine uh, functions. We have very sloppy open loops where we do not update how we give drugs or how we even teach young people based on what's going on, based on their responses. So how do we build closed loop systems? There are many ways. How we do it in our lab is through video games, right? The most powerful form of interactive me uh, media. It's immersive, it's engaging, and it's a perfect way to create a closed loop. How do we do that? So here's a cartoon. You're playing a video game, a custom designed closed loop video game. Something occurs in your brain that guides your behavior. This can be recorded as a performance, how fast you are, how accurate you are. Our games record this data in real time and then updates the challenge and the environment based on how the person's doing. So whether you're 8 or 80 years old, you don't have to enter that information. The game knows where you are at that moment and challenges you right at that state, creating a flow state so that you're interacting at the highest level of your abilities. We believe that this is how you harness the plasticity. Then we could take other technology tools, like motion capture, which you could get you know, Best Buy or on Amazon right now, physiological devices that often yield completely unactionable data. We could have that data also flowing into the game. So now the game understands you in a deeper way <clears throat> than just knowing how you're performing in terms of your accuracy or response time. <clears throat> then we could use technologies like augmented and virtual reality to create even more immersive, engaging environments. We can wrap this all together with advances in AI and machine learning so that what we create here is a truly integrated, multimodal, closed-loop system. I believe that this will be the future alongside and replacing in many ways what we currently do with medications and education. These closed-loop systems will be a powerful way to help improve our minds. I'm just going to give you one quick example from our work. Uh, in 2008, I was inspired to create a video game to do exactly what I just described to you. I reached out to friends of mine that work at LucasArts, and we built this game called NeuroRacer. It's a multitasking game. And our question was, can we improve cognitive control abilities in older adults who we know are impaired if they play the game? 
And first thing we found is that cognitive controllability has declined. So on the left side of that figure is 20-year-olds, and on the right side is 80-year-olds. So this is the ability to multitask on the game. So despite what you may believe about your multitasking abilities, even 20-year-olds suffer decrement when they multitask on our game. But it's not an ability that you just preserve your entire life just to plummet in one tragic year when you're 69. You just plummet every tragic year of your life, just like that. But what we find is that if you play the game, and our older adults played it for 12 hours over the course of a month, so they played it one hour a day, three days a week for four weeks, then they came back into the lab. We showed that they improved their multitasking abilities beyond that of 20-year-olds. Uh, and what I'm not showing you in details, we could see that they engaged their prefrontal cortex and its networks with the rest of the brain at the level of 20-year-olds. But what's most important, and we published this in the end of 2013 in this journal, Nature, is that we showed that we can also improve their ability to remember faces over short periods of time and to pay attention in a sustained way. So that's the transfer that we're looking for. You get better at the game, that's great, but all these, these other abilities in cognitive control also improve. So this is the pathway that we can start building, you know, essentially consumer technology at that level. We now have a new lab, it's literally 10 minutes from here at UCSF called Neuroscape, where our goal is to see if we could ultimately bridge this gap that exists right now between non-invasive consumer technology and neuroscience to create these tools to elevate how our brains and our minds function. I just want to give you a quick snapshot of what our lab looks like. That's our new neuroscience building. Um, so in the bottom pictures, you see the lab. It's not, a, you know, it doesn't look like a, a traditional neuroscience lab, but that's where we do our experiments. We create our interactive media there using all the tools that I just described to you. Our participants come in, they get an MRI, they get an EEG, they do stress testing, we do blood work looking at telomeres, inflammatory markers, and then they play the games that we create for months sometimes. They come back, and then we can see in a very careful way what is changing. How are we pushing that envelope? Technology that we're excited about, obviously mobile and wireless, right? Just because of the accessibility. You could see here we do real-time EEG recordings during gameplay to understand how these networks are changing in response to the challenges from the game. Here's a study that we did on a, a game that we created, a meditation-inspired game called Meditrain. And you can see young people in India, foster children, using the game to try to improve their ability to sustain their attention and resist distraction. Two other technologies that we're very excited about is virtual reality. That fellow over there on the left is Mickey Hart, the drummer from The Grateful Dead. We created a game called Rhythmicity to try to channel uh, our ability to be rhythmic, improve it, to see if we can increase other aspects of our brains that really require timing and anticipation, just like rhythm. And M Mickey has on there an Oculus Rift and a 64-channel EEG. So we can literally see what's happening while you're engaging in the challenge. And then, of course, motion capture. To have games that you just don't sit there and play with your eyeballs and your fingers, but move, engage your entire body, something we call embodied cognition. We have a game called Body Brain Trainer that challenges you both physically and cognitively at the same time. And there, the closed loop exists in the cognitive domain. As you're being challenged cognitively, like your memory and attention, those uh, challenges are increasing. But we also record your heart rate during gameplay. So if we set your heart rate at 120 to 140, let's say, based on a VO2 max, then if your heart rate is too low, the game just increases the amplitude and the frequency of your movements drives your heart rate up. If your heart rate goes too high, the game just pulls it back. So that's another way that we could use physiological devices to put you right in that sweet spot. We now know that we're not going to accomplish our ultimate goal <coughs> in a laboratory, even a great place like UCSF. This is where we have to learn to navigate that complex relationship between academics and industry. We can't really create scalable products in a lab. We can incubate things, we can figure out how they work, but if we really want to move it into people's lives, we have to learn how to work with industry. So I co-founded this company called Achille, part based in Boston, part based right here in Marin. And now we've taken that technology behind Neuroracer and built a much better game, right? So if you want young people to play a game and it doesn't have violence in it, which none of our games do, then you have to bring on much higher levels of art, music, and story. Create very rapid closed loops, all the reward systems. So the folks from LucasArts helped co-found this company. We have tons of top-level game professionals. So as scientists, we have to realize that we might do some things well, but not everything, and work with professionals in the industry that have these skills to create really engaging medium. Now, 
this is a somewhat polarizing conversation. Not everyone agrees with the decision, but this game is not available to the consumer market right now. What we're doing is seeing if we could get this game validated at the very highest level as diagnostic and therapeutic tools. So right now, there are multiple clinical trials <clears throat> across all these conditions, autism, post-traumatic stress disorder, anxiety, traumatic brain injury, Alzheimer's disease, multiple sclerosis, and ADHD. And right now, across the country, in nine sites, we're doing a full FDA approval clinical trial to see if this game, Evo, can be essentially the first non-drug treatment for ADHD and the first prescribable video game anywhere. So we'll have that data. Yes, video game. So anyway, it's a... It's an interesting challenge to the system. Actually, the pharmaceutical industry is very excited about this. They realize the limitations in the products that they've created for the last 30 years and are looking forward to a new product. So we'll know the, the data in July, and um, <clears throat> we'll be starting a big full-scale depression study and autism study later this year. So I think it's a really exciting time. Hopefully, I express my enthusiasm for how technology, and a lot of it being developed right here, can be positioned not just to entertain and delight us and help us communicate, but really to elevate our minds. And with that, I thank you for your attention.